Welcome to the Center for Computational and Data Sciences virtual speaker series. Before I introduce Axel, I want to mention that we have two upcoming talks, and this year's theme has to do with computational political research. And so, uh, so it's that's a loose kind of uh, bucket. So most of our topics are going to be kind of in that ballpark. The next speaker is Heather Evans. Um, that's going to be October 22nd. Um, and then the one after that is Anders Olaf Larson. And so I'm going to be sending out invites for these talks um, in the next week or so. <clears throat> Today, I'm delighted to introduce doc, Dr. Axel Bruns, whose talk is titled From the Fringes to the Mainstream, How COVID-19 Conspiracy Theories Spread Across Social and Mainstream Media. So Axel is an Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow and Professor in Digital Media Research Center at Queensland University um, of Technology in Brisbane, Australia. So he's joining us many, many different time zones away. He is a Chief Investigator of the ARC Center for, of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society and has among his publications two books I highly recommend. One is called Are Filter Bubbles Real? And the other, which is kind of near and dear to me since I study gatekeeping, is Gate Watching and News Curation, Journalism, Social Media, and the Public Sphere. I've known Alex for about a decade, and I've always found interesting and useful tidbits in his research talks. So I know I'm going to enjoy this, and I hope you do too. So help me welcome Axel Bruns. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Jeff. And yeah, it's uh, it's great to see you, and it's great to see everyone, at least uh, in in this way. Uh, I, I said earlier, well, it'd be great to come and visit you at some point as well, but uh, that's probably still some time away. So uh, this is the the next best, I guess, that we can do. Let me start by sharing my screen here, so we can get going. And uh, start the timer as well. I'm hoping that you can see uh, the slides. Um, so uh, yeah, so, so so yes, thank you again um, for the invitation. I'll say too that what I'm presenting here is is really work that um, I've done with my colleagues Edward Herkham and uh, Stephen Harrington in our center as well. Um, so um, uh, yeah, they've they've played a really vital role in in, in doing this research as well. Um, before I get started, let me just uh, acknowledge. As we do here in Australia, the, the traditional owners of the lands upon, upon, upon which I uh, work and live, the Turbo and Yagara people here in Brisbane as the First Nations owners of uh, these lands um, to pay respect to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits and recognize that these unceded lands have always been places of teaching, research and learning. Um, and I acknowledge the important role that our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, still play within the QT community. Okay, so um, what I want to talk about uh, is, of course, this uh, flood of mis and disinformation related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the UN, as you probably know, has uh, begun to talk about an infodemic alongside the viral pandemic um, since uh, really March last year, since early last year. Um, so uh, it's been very widely recognized that there is a very uh, substantial amount of uh, mis and disinformation floating around, of course, in relation to the um, the pandemic. Um, now, what shape that takes um, is sometimes as, as simple as this. This is from the the rapper Wiz Khalifa, um, who just put out a, a post on Facebook at some point saying, "Well, is it Corona? Is it 5G? Or both? You know, what what really is behind all of this?" And this is really just the the very tip of the iceberg. So I'm not trying to um, to point to him particularly as a source of mis or disinformation, but um, this is as how far it, it travels and how visible um, these questions and, um, uh, you know, claims around, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the real origins of the pandemic or, or other aspects uh, of it uh, come. And this is what they lead to. So in uh, April, from April last year, we saw um, attacks on um, cell towers uh, right across uh, the UK in particular, but also in other countries that were 
very clearly driven by the spread of mis and disinformation, particularly around the supposed and entirely incorrect, it has to be said, I, I want to make that quite clear, links between uh, COVID and uh, 5G wireless technology. So um, people were, as you can see there from the image from the New York Times, attacking mobile phone towers. They were attacking some of the technicians um, uh, who were either protecting or, or, or maintaining them. Um, so this became not just an online spread of mis and disinformation, but it had real physical consequences, both in terms of damage to property as well as injury to technicians. And uh, so that's how far um, this has, has spread. And of course, I could cite many more and possibly more substantial problems there as well um, in, in relation to other conspiracy theories, but this is the one I'll focus on most. And of course, in the end, there's also um, forced reactions from, from governments. This is advised by the Australian government, for instance, um, basically warning people of the misinformation around 5G and COVID-19 that's circulating and trying to set the record straight, uh, more or possibly less successfully. Um, here in Brisbane, for instance, we've had even uh, marches by anti-5G protesters um, who, as the, the tweet here says, ironically actually gathered in the, the place where 5G reception uh, so far is best in Brisbane. Um, but this was repeated right around the country and, and well beyond um, uh, Australia as well, that we have these protesters, they sometimes join up, of course, with other conspiracy theorists and others um, who are, um, yeah, uh, talking about the, the dangers of 5G, but here in, in this example, as you can see, also link this to uh, other um, potentially controversial topics like vaccination and really the pandemic overall and everything to do with it. So there's a confluence here of different um, conspiracy theories, different flashpoints in relation to the pandemic as well that, um, that emerges from all of this. And um, this is a, a slightly different story, but I did want to just uh, share this with you as well. Um, what we've also seen, and my colleague uh, Tim Graham here particularly has done some work on this, um, looking at some of the, the um, accounts, in this case on Twitter, that are actively spreading some of this stuff as well. And we do see some degree of coordinated activity, of course, that's pushing some of these conspiracy stories here as well. Um, in this case, uh, you know, we, we saw the conspiracy that... Um, 5G was a bioweapon uh, launched by, by China, particularly pushed by pro-Trump accounts. Um, so, um, you know, there, there is not just an organic kind of bubbling up of mis- and disinformation, but clearly at times this is very actively um, encouraged and pushed forward by organi organized campaigns by, uh, you know, by, by trolls and, and, and particular interest groups as well, essentially. So this is the sort of environment in which this talk really operates. I will focus particularly on the 5G conspiracy theory here because it is simply a very useful case to study this. Um, but I could have picked the bioweapon conspiracy theory and various others as well that, that probably would work in a very similar way as well. And of course, others have done some of that work as well. So the questions here are, you know, what are the claims that are circulating how, how do they evolve over time, I guess, as well? Um, who's spreading this? What's the media response in the first place? That's a really important aspect, I think. Um, so how is this treated in the media? How, how, to what extent, is it debunked in the media and so on? Um, what about takedowns and other actions against this kind of content or the people who spread it? And what do the official actors do, whether that's government authorities, um, official spokespeople, possibly spokespeople for the technology companies, um, the, the mobile providers and so on, um, and medical experts and so on. So what's, what's their response? How does that play out? Do they respond? And perhaps when should they actually be responding to this? Um, now to do this, what we've done uh, in our study is to, in the first place, generate a data set from Facebook um, that searched for a bunch of terms related to COVID and 5G. Um, so any posts uh, that we could capture via CrowdTangle, um, the Facebook data access tool that essentially thematized both the, the COVID pandemic and 5G. Um, we limited ourselves here for this study to the time frame from the start of 2020, so well before COVID became a pandemic officially, to the middle of uh, April 2020 when um, the arson attacks in the, US, in the UK had happened. Um, and, and had spread elsewhere as well. So at that point, of course, the story really changed to one about the arson attacks particularly. Um, although arguably in the meantime since then, 
as that subsided, we've, we're seeing a further spread of the 5G conspiracy theories as well. So we could really go on until today, of course, as well. Um, now, as we work with CrowdTangle, I do need to uh, flag some of the limitations here as well. Um, and those are that uh, CrowdTangle provides data only on public pages, groups, and verified profiles. And to make that a bit easier for me, I'll, I'll call these public spaces on Facebook uh, for the rest of this talk. Um, uh, CrowdTangle data is somewhat uh, different across different countries as well. So um, its coverage is not necessarily quite as good with these public spaces in uh, countries uh, outside of the US, the UK, and other major English speaking uh, nations. Um, Facebook itself, of course, is also used differently and to different extents across different nations. So um, this really is about uh, you know, the, the footprint of this uh, conspiracy theory on Facebook rather than the full spread. Uh, for that, we'd have to look at many other platforms as well. Um, the way that we gather data, of course, used terms in the Latin alphabet. So um, we haven't got data on the spread in um, other uh, uh, scripts in Cyrillic or um, Chinese characters, Japanese characters, and so on. Um, so um, there's bound to be more spread of these conspiracy theories elsewhere, unless, of course, we have captured them because they happen to use the terms 5G or COVID in Latin letters within um, uh, text in other scripts. And of course, in some la local languages, uh, like Polish here, coronavirus uh, spells it with a K and a W. So we wouldn't pick up on that unless, again, they used uh, the, the, the terms that we're more familiar with in, in English as well. But overall, this, this netted us about 90,000 posts for this time period. Um, and as we found, there were some false positives there still, where, for instance, there were stories coming out of China about the use of 5G drones to um, uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, disinfect neighborhoods, to spray disinfectant across neighborhoods, or the, the use of 5G in, in the hospitals that were being built to, to treat uh, the COVID, and, uh, COVID pandemic. So some of these posts have nothing to do with the 5G COVID conspiracy th uh, theory itself, um, but that became very clear from the data analysis ultimately as well. So that's the Facebook data that we're working with. And then via the, the GDELT database, the global database on events, locations, and topics, which is basically a global news database, um, uh, we searched in a very similar way for um, content related to COVID and 5G for the same time frame. Uh, the limitation of GDELT is that um, it doesn't contain the full text of articles. It, it contains things like the article titles and the article URLs. And that's really what we matched on ultimately. Um, the benefit of that actually is that we are getting articles that very distinctly in their title in the URL address COVID and 5G together. So we're not getting articles where perhaps there is just an incidental mention somewhere of 5G in an article somewhere in the in the 10th paragraph, but ultimately the article is, some, is about something else. So this is actually not even a particularly significant limitation. It, it may be quite beneficial for us because we're really getting the articles that are very specifically about this topic. Um, GDELT, again, has no doubt better coverage in, in the major languages around the world, particularly in English, than it has in some, some much minor languages. Um, again, we're limited to the Latin alphabet, and, and we're not capturing those divergent local terms. But uh, overall, that um, gave us 2,800 articles. Again, we manually reviewed them and coded them. And uh, after removing those false positives that we saw here as well, we had 1,800 or so true positives that were, that were left. So that's the kind of data sets really that I'm working with here. And um, I'll talk about both of these and the analysis of both of these side by side, although obviously the Facebook data set is larger. So I'm, I'm going to focus a little bit more on that than on the media side. But the media side becomes quite important um, uh, towards the end here as well. So let me um, uh, point also uh, to the three um, outputs from this that we have, and I can share, of course, the, the slide deck with you afterwards as well, so you can see these. But um, essentially, the, the Facebook part of this we published in a journal called Media International Australia. Um, the media coverage, the GDEL part, uh, we've just published in Digital Journalism. That's just out, I think, a couple of weeks ago. And then there's a book chapter that's about to come out that um, basically puts these two together. And that's really that the combined analysis is what I will be talking about today um, uh, in particular. So let me get to that analysis then uh, after that preamble. Um, first off, to give you an idea just of the, the overall kind of volume of posts on Facebook at the top there, 
and GDEL coverage or media coverage uh, at the bottom. And obviously, you can see that um, the Facebook um, spread of these conspiracy theories does uh, pick up quite a bit earlier than any kind of media coverage does. Um, so uh, in, in some ways, this is a typical example of uh, conspiracy th theories circulating on social media and then finally being picked up in mainstream media and being addressed in mainstream media in some form. Now, um, there is a bit more to this, though, uh, that I'll, I'll get to in a, in a moment as well. But um, clearly, we're seeing that uh, there is some early circulation on Facebook. In fact, um, we've broken down the Facebook circulation, the pulse per day, into five phases that I'm going to step through. Um, uh, the, the very early January phase when nothing much happens, then a phase in, in late January to late February where things are starting to pick up. And then you see this kind of ramping up basically through phase three, four. And of course, phase five is really when those arson attacks are happening on, uh, um, on the, the mobile towers in the UK and elsewhere. So that's when really um, activity on Facebook as well as media activity really picks up. I have broken it down here by types uh, of posts on Facebook as well, although there isn't probably all that much to say about this uh, uh, at this point, other than perhaps that down the track, um, really from phase four or so onwards, we do see perhaps a greater amount of, um, of video circulations. So um, let me step through the phases then. And we start with that phase one that really is uh, throughout January. Um, in the first phase, we're not actually seeing all that much during this time. And uh, if you saw the, the slide before, uh, the, there's almost a flat line during most of January. Uh, what circulates at this point is largely just pre-existing claims about 5G. There were, of course, um, people who were um, warning about the supposed dangers of 5G radiation and so on. And before that, presumably of 4G and 3G and 2G radiation as well, mobile phones generally. Um, uh, well before the pandemic and well before any kind of outbreaks. Um, so uh, uh, there, there, there was some material that, that was circulating about 5G. Um, some of this warned more vaguely about pandemics or the, the, the um, I guess, the health risks of 5G that could make people more susceptible to viruses and all these sorts of claims. Again, none of that is true. And I want to make that quite clear. These These are genuine conspiracy theories, but um, uh, these conspiracy theories had been going on about the uh, implication of 5G and potential uh, viral outbreaks for some time. Um, some of this also overlap with a wide array of other um, conspiracy theories about vaccines, about the world government, about chemtrails, about everything else that you could mention that you can imagine as, as conspiracy theories. Um, and then finally, um, in uh, late January, on the 20th of, Jan of January, this is the first evidence that we find of a genuine direct, uh, a pulse genuinely and directly linking uh, 5G and COVID um, together in this French blog, actually, uh, Les Moutons Orangés, which I think means the outraged sheep. Um, so they were the first really to uh, talk about what they call their five genocide and uh, the first to claim any kind of relationship between 5G and, and COVID-19, basically saying that Wuhan was a test region uh, in China for the 5G rollout, and now there's a pandemic, so connect the dots, essentially, is, I guess, the argument that they're trying to make. Um, but partly because all of this circulated only in French at this point, um, and partly because these are quite outlandish cons conspiracy theories, this really reached Facebook spaces still with a very limited audience by Facebook standards, really spaces with under 100,000 followers generally. Um, and no one covered this in, in any kind of media. Even the fringe news sites, your Infowars and others that um, are actually covered by GDELT as well, um, did not pick up on this, did not cover this in any way. So even for them, it seems that this was just too outlandish a theory to, to embrace. Um, and partly, perhaps, it, it just wasn't on their radar because it wasn't circulating in English at that point anyway. Um, as we move into phase two, this really spreads and it, 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 it builds up from there. So the French uh, content appeared then also translated in German on, a, um, on an alternative medicine site, essentially. Um, and here's a Facebook post um, that picks up on this and, and links to it. Uh, and again, it, it makes that claim that Wuhan was a was a test region for 5G, and that uh, therefore it's not a surprise that the pandemic broke out there. As you see there, after the fact, of course, Facebook has now uh, essentially 
hidden or, or overlaid uh, this this link um, with a false information warning. Uh, so that wouldn't have been there at the time, obviously, but it does show that some of those warnings that Facebook has introduced for some of these conspiracy theories are now also appearing in this kind of, or alongside this kind of content. Although, of course, you can still click through if you really want to. Um, as the next step, oddly enough, um, an English language version of these claims, which may have been a more or less direct translation of the German text, appeared first in a K-pop fan forum, um, maybe just as an opportunity uh, uh, because that wasn't moderated or whatever and it was easy to post something there. Maybe that, that fan forum had been overrun in some form by conspiracy theorists, I'm not quite sure. And that, that particular URL is now down. So presumably the, the forum actually has taken it down as well. But um, this is sort of how it made its, it, its way first into English, oddly enough. Um, and then gradually other English language conspiracy pages and sites picked up on this more, embellished the story, saying that the virus was manufactured in a Wuhan lab that was activated by 5G or whatever. Um, and this really started to, to break out a bit more. Now, oddly enough, around that same time, um, the UK government also decided to allow uh, the Chinese company Huawei to uh, help build its 5G network. So 5G might have been much more visible in English language conversations during that time as well. And that might have actually picked up, um, help, help this story pick up. Um, there was also a, a lot of criticism from uh, the US administration uh, towards the UK government at that point because of the concerns about Huawei. And, and that decision was later reversed by the British government as well. Um, so there was simply a lot of conversation about 5G and it, it's quite possible that partly because of that, the 5G conspiracy stories also got more visibility um, as, a, as an after effect of that. And gradually now we're seeing the reach grow as well, partly because again, it makes its way into English language spaces, which are possibly larger as well. So 10% of the spaces during this time that were actually addressing this topic uh, now had up to 1 million followers. Um, I'll talk about the media coverage uh, alongside phase three, because again, even at that point, there wasn't that much media coverage uh, just yet. In phase three, um, so from the late, late February to about mid-March, um, this really spreads further and kind of metastasizes, uh, metastasizes a bit. Um, so gradually this 5G story gets linked with other popular conspiracy theories. Um, uh, you may be familiar with some of those conspiracy theories around, you know, uh, secret plans to depopulate the world, and that features all the usual boogeymen of the uh, of the conspiracy um, um, uh, scene. George Soros, Bill Gates, the UN, the Illuminati, the Antichrist all make an appearance during this time. Um, some of it gets linked with alter alternative medicine theories, so theories circulate that 5G somehow reduces oxygen, oxygen absorption, and that's why people with, with COVID are having trouble breathing. Um, general virus denialism even, that COVID doesn't exist, that is all 5G and nothing else. Um, uh, some of this gets further adjusted also as the pandemic itself spreads, um, so people may, not, may no longer be saying, well, it's all just 5G, but 5G is just making it worse or whatever, or 5G is being rolled to make it rolled out to make it worse and so on. Um, but you're seeing this kind of a confluence of different conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. Everyone with a conspiracy theory is basically retrofitting COVID-19 into that story and, and, and connecting it with that story. And uh, we see this multilingual spread as well. Here's a Romanian post. I'm not expecting you to read Romanian, but you probably see their names like George Soros and Bill Gates again pop up very much in the middle of that post. So um, uh, again, there is that really transnational and translingual um, visibility of some of these typical targets of attack for conspiracy theorists in, in whatever language you're working in. And as much as I can make out, yeah, this is again talking about, um, you know, the the that we're being experimented upon with vaccines, that there's an uh, international conspiracy that yeah, Soros and Gates are leading this and so on. Um, and this spreads really right across, particularly uh, Southern and Eastern Europe. Uh, so Romania, Czech Republic, Croatia, Italy, Spain, France as well. Um, interestingly enough, and I don't want to point fingers, but these are also often typical targets of uh, Russian disinformation. So it is possible that there is some uh, degree of um, uh, coordinated activity going on there as well. Um, some of the outbreaks in these countries also seem to be aligned with the timing of national lockdowns and other actions against the, the pandemic. 
Um, it may simply be that people in lockdown have more time for doom scrolling, for, for you know, reading up on obscure spaces online um, because there's nothing else to do. They're sitting at home and they, they, they can't go anywhere. So perhaps they're trying to work out well, what's going on here and um, thereby finding more of these obscure spaces and, uh, and then sharing content possibly as well. Um, however, still uh, up to 70% of the spaces that are active during this time have, have fewer than 10,000 followers. So this is still circulating around the fringes, particularly at this point. Uh, and the media coverage at this point is still very limited. We picked up about 43 articles during phases two and three, and they are uh, largely dominated by fringe outlets from the US, I'm sorry to say. So that is your InfoWars and various other um, uh, obvious uh, fringe outlets that are um, frequently spreading conspiracy theories. Um, uh, we do see a handful of fact check articles on 5G and COVID, however, but they appear in very different spaces, technology sites, business sites, um, and they wouldn't have reached the same audiences quite likely as the conspiracy theories themselves. So there's fact checking, but it might just not really help much to convince people who are now browsing these, these fringe conspiracy spaces um, that their conspiracies are wrong. Um, where it really then picks up is that phase four. And that's really the critical kind of tipping point, I would say. Um, so from mid-March onwards, we're seeing a real growth in, in media coverage, media interest in this. Partly this is driven by celebrities getting involved. And one of the first that we saw is the R&B singer, Kerry Hilson. Uh, so here's a story from GQ Buzz on, on Facebook. Um, which reports essentially on her going on Twitter to say, well, hey, look, this is all 5G, you know, turn off your 5G on your phones, um, um, by disabling LTE, which doesn't actually work. Um, uh, you know, there's, she's obviously, you know, as they say, done her research and found a lot of um, um, conspiracy stories from all over the place, um, talking about the levels of radiation from 5G and so on, turned that all into a tweet to her many followers. And then, of course, as soon as a celebrity says something strange and uh, controversial, the entertainment media like GQ here are, are all over it. Um, so uh, this is the sort of stuff that we're getting. Um, and yes, entertainment and tabloid media are jumping right onto her and others who are doing, doing this, who are saying these sorts of things. They're often doing this in a slightly humorous and, and kind of incredulous kind of tone, but they're also doing it quite uncritically. So. This is the story from GQ Buzz, for instance, um, that is, as you see there, very directly um, uh, citing Kerry Hilson herself. It's embedding a tweet from her. Uh, and of course, that makes that tweet even more visible. Um, so in many ways, these tabloid media, while they might you know, say, hey, you know, this stupid celebrity got themselves into hot water by saying something controversial, um, they're also helping to spread that information that the celebrity has posted particularly two, and I can't remember with this one specifically, but if they're embedding screenshots rather than just the tweets themselves, then those screenshots, of course, will continue to persist on these sites, even if the celebrity thinks, thinks better of it and takes that post down again. So um, it's quite possible that even though Hilson, in the meantime, has taken down those tweets in this article, those tweets are still alive and people can still see what, what she said and can still see the conspiracy theories that she spread possibly even go to the links that she spread. So this is really problematic, obviously, and it, it enhances the visibility, but also the longevity of this content beyond the celebrity themselves posting them on their Twitter or Facebook. feed. So this is actually quite problematic. So the celebrity reporting gives us a lot more longevity and a lot more, um, a lot more lasting impact ultimately. Um, so yeah, a number of the celebrities who get involved, and Kerry Hilson's not the only one, kind of delete their content again after the backlash that they're getting, after people are getting to them. Maybe their managers are just saying to them, hey, stop this um, and, and take it down again. Some, some of them will do that. Um, but uh, the, the circulation of their claims continues well beyond them perhaps having a rethink. Um, the, we do see also quite significant spread here in uh, other regions of the world, uh, in Africa and Southeast Asia, partly also again because the entertainment media in, in those regions are picking up on celebrities elsewhere. We saw the, the popular site in, in, in the Philippines, Rappler, um, which is uh, covering a lot of um, celebrity content, for instance. So from Kerry Hilson and others, it spreads into the Philippines and it spreads into Southern Africa and other places uh, because they pick up on these celebrities saying these things. Um, 
Um, we also see some amplification for some other prominent conspiracy theorists through this, including sometimes politicians and journalists. Um, and in part, this is again because the celebrities are actually pointing attention towards them too. And as a result of all of this starting to happen, we're seeing also a growth in the reach of this content because now they're not just circulating in fringe spaces, but they're circulating via the, 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 the personal pages of celebrities, they're circulating via the entertainment um, media um, pages on Facebook. Um, so we're seeing a considerable, considerable growth in the reach of this content. And um, the media coverage, as I say, really changes during this time. It's still at this point, because this, this is still the, the start of the, the real outbreak, um, it's still somewhat low. Um, we pick up about 100 articles during this uh, time of, of about two weeks. Um, and many of them are entertainment and lifestyle outlets, tabloids, and so on. Many of them contain direct quotes of the conspiracists themselves, or at least of the celebrities' social media posts, which in turn quote conspiracy content. Um, but there is also, and this is uh, obviously good to see, a growth in fact-checking art articles. However, again, not necessarily in the spaces that are most active in spreading this conspiracy content. And then finally, we get, we get to the, the final phase in, in this time frame from late March uh, to mid-April, um, where emboldened to some extent by the celebrity and media coverage, we're seeing more of these uh, outlandish um, conspiracy claims being made. And really, the range of content here broadens out as well. So we, we saw, for instance, a, a post in, in French which you know, does some basic numerology to, to say, well, corona is of the devil and, um, and all of that. It's linked to the number 666 and so on. Um, now, this sort of stuff, if you look at it, you wouldn't think it actually goes very far. But in Africa, in French-speaking Africa and France, it reaches nearly 30 million followers via Facebook. Um, or, look, I, I need to say it potentially reaches, obviously. We can only see the follower numbers of these spaces. We, we don't know if all of those followers necessarily see the post, but the potential reach of this is up to uh, 30 million followers. It does get, get translated into English versions as well, so it circulates even more uh, there. Uh, we're seeing, in fact, quite a bit of, um, uh, of African evangelicals getting involved here as well. This is a, a apparently quite popular um, evangelical pastor in, in Nigeria who, as you see there, is drawing up some strange, um, vaguely Sean Hannity-like kind of map of connections um, between um, COVID and uh, vaccines and 5G and everything else. The Internet of Things is in there as well. Um, the New World Order is in there, so um, bringing together all these kinds of conspiracy theories to, to connect them up. Um, that uh, has an audience, a potential audience of, of up to, uh, of, of over 43 million followers across the space that it's shared. Um, there is, and this is perhaps the most, most direct link to the arson attacks that happen later on, a post that ends with, um, uh, we need to clip, clip all, all wires and burn it all in massive bonfires, fire destroys all. Um, which seems to be a fairly direct incitement to attack these 5G technologies and, and 5G towers. Now, the reason I'm showing, you, showing it to you in this form is because this is actually later on taken down as well. So um, this is one of those posts that, that Facebook genuinely has taken down rather than just hidden behind a warning. Um, and that's made at, on the 30th of March, just before the attacks start to happen uh, in the UK. So. Um, while we, we don't really quite have a smoking gun here, there's certainly an interesting alignment there in the timelines. And it's quite possible that this post would have circulated into particularly perhaps evangelical communities in, in, uh, in the UK and possibly more, more African British communities in the UK as well. So there is a pathway from here into the UK that's quite probable. Um, we do see again, uh, yeah, spread in Southern Africa, spread in the UK, um, in anti-5G spaces particularly, we also see something, uh, so this is the, the, the notice now on that post as it now appears, um, and where it basically says this is not available. So maybe the owner's taken it down, maybe Facebook has banned it, we're not sure, but it's just no longer available, which is probably a good thing. Um, we, so, we see weird things like this as well. Um, uh, this, is, this claims to be by a former executive of Vodafone uh, in the UK. Um, as it turns out from media reporting after the fact, this is actually a, a Zimbabwean pastor that's based in Luton in the UK, 
who has claimed to be a former Vodafone executive and is making these claims. So for some reason, there is a strong um, evangelical connection here with this particular claim in the UK, especially. Uh, it's just very odd and not really easily explainable. Um, but this again, uh, potentially reaches 18, an audience of 18 million followers. And then again, we see celebrities uh, jump in as well. This is the, the boxer Amir Khan in the US, who, as you see, they're saying it's a man-made thing. It's a population control plot, blah, blah, blah. He's basically recorded a video in isolation or in, in, uh, in quarantine and, uh, um, and has put this out via his YouTube channel. This is then reposted as well by a page called Give Me Sport, where it reaches a very substantial audience. Um, of 25 million or so, and um, uh, and this is the the article on the Give Me Sports site itself, which directly embeds his conspiracy video. So again, um, even uh, it's, it it doesn't really reach an audience simply just just via Amir Khan's own channels or via the Facebook Spaces um, that repost his content, but a popular sports news site in the UK then directly embeds this conspiracy video into its content as well, making it even more visible. And that's obviously deeply problematic. And if that wasn't enough, the Express uh, tabloid in the UK covers this. And really in, a, in an article that, that broadly talks about um, uh, YouTube takedowns and so on, it again embeds the video talking about conspiracies by a conspiracy friendly celebrity um, directly there under the first paragraph of the story. So what you're taking away from that story is probably not so much that YouTube is taking, is tightening the rules, but that this celebrity is talking about how coronavirus is linked to 5G. Um, so this is obviously deeply, deeply problematic and, and just journalistically, I think, an absolute disgrace, frankly. Um, so, uh, so this is, but this is the sort of behavior that we do see, particularly from tabloids, particularly from entertainment sites, over and over again in our data. Um, and, you know, because of all of this, again, it, it, it starts to reach much bigger audiences. 60% of posts now are in spaces with more than 10,000 followers. Um, and of course, during this time, we're really seeing the arson attacks also starting to happen in the UK, then later in the Netherlands and elsewhere as well since early April. Um, now, in terms of the media coverage, um, uh, this is really the, the bulk of the media coverage, of course, that happens. Um, a good chunk of this, about a, a third or so, is about the arson attacks themselves. Another quarter is uh, broadly about the spread of conspiracy theories relating to COVID um, uh, and, and focusing to some extent directly on 5G conspiracy theories as part of this. Um, so there is a bit more um, general and, and objective reporting possibly uh, going on there. Um, uh, there is still about 11% that, that focus on the, the conspiracy claims by celebrities, so that's not going away. And of course, 11% of this much larger amount is still a, a much bigger visibility than uh, the, uh, the the 90 odd articles that we saw in the previous phase, which were which were focused on um, on those celebrity claims much more. Um, we also see 11% roughly of of these articles uh, covering the government responses. So. Uh, this sort of stuff in another tabloid in the UK, The Mirror. Um, uh, so governments now get involved and say, this is, as, as it says, the dangerous nonsense and rubbish. Um, uh, of, of course, unfortunately, if you uh, send out someone like, like uh, Minister Gov here, um, uh, that may not actually help uh, debunk conspiracy theories because he is himself so deeply distrusted by much of the UK public. So um, uh, sending out credible and uh, reliable and uh, perhaps independent spokespeople might be more useful than sending out a government minister who's been widely criticized for, for many other things. Um, so, uh, but we do see some more government responses starting to happen during this point as well. Um, what we're seeing during this time, and this is obviously good to see, is that there is a reduction overall in the direct quoting and direct endorsement of conspiracies and cons conspiracists. Um, much of the content here is now plain news reporting largely about the arson attacks. That's not necessarily surprising, but it is still a, a, you know, a, a kind of a, a return to perhaps some more journalistic, um, uh, standard journalistic approaches. Um, so moving away from some of the sensationalism and some of the, the, the very unreflected reporting towards a, a more cautious reporting, but it has taken you know 60 odd arson attacks to get to that point, which is obviously um, so just uh, because I've mentioned this along the way, this is 
um, the change in the size of pages uh, as a percentage of the total over time. So you see there that really through the middle, through to the middle of March or so, um, about 30 to 40 percent of all pages um, that were sharing this content had fewer than 10 followers. Um, that uh, maybe 70 to to 80 percent of pages had fewer uh, or had yeah, had fewer than than 10,000 followers. And you see that from about the middle of March onwards, larger pages become much more active in sharing this kind of content. So the the percentage of pages that have 100,000 plus or a million plus followers grows. The percentage of, of pages even with 10,000 plus followers grows. Um, so we're seeing from that point that the celebrities particularly get involved, uh, much more visibility, much more reach ultimately or potential reach across Facebook. Um, and of course, again, these are only the public spaces. Um, so uh, what we cannot see from any of our data is the further circulation through private spaces, through private, public, uh, private profiles and so on. Um, and, and of course, private groups and, and, and these sorts of spaces as well, uh, direct messaging and so on. Um, but the larger the, the reach via these, these public spaces, the, the larger presumably is also the, the, the on-sharing um, through the private parts of Facebook. Um, also, and again, the, the numbers here are very different during phases one to three, phase four and phase five in terms of the the news articles that we've got in our data set. So I don't want to uh, make too much of this, but uh, having looked at how the conspiracy theory is, is treated, um, in that first phase, we're seeing a lot of content that either outright supports the conspiracy theory, um, or at least reports and quotes on conspiracy claims. Um, during the fourth phase, we're seeing less support, but far more reporting and quoting, and that's really the the celebrity phase where celebrity interventions in all of this are being reported, being quoted, being simply passed on essentially in a very stenographic way. Um, and then finally in that fifth phase, uh, journalistic coverage really re 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 reverts to a, a more standard model of, of reporting and fact checking with uh, a great deal more caution about directly quoting conspiracy theorists, although there is still a, a good chunk of that going on as well. Um, and unfortunately, I have to say, this hasn't stopped since then. So this is a much more recent example um, from uh, August this year of an Australian story um, uh, which circulated across the, the, the News Corp network. Um, that's the same company that owns Fox News and the Wall Street Journal in the, U in the US, of course, um, of uh, basically a kind of a, a list of the top 10 misinformation spreaders in Australia. Um, now, um, this is hopefully quite self-evidently problematic because what it does is do the very opposite of deplatforming. It actively platforms these people and makes them much more visible um, to ordinary news audiences in Australia. It, lit it literally lists um, the, the, the top 10 misinformation spreaders. It uh, provides direct access essentially for people who are curious about misinformation um, uh, to these people. So it, it really is a genuine boost, unfortunately, to these uh, misinformation spreaders and their visibility. So even today, and even by journalists who otherwise are actually pretty good in what they do, um, there are still these deeply problematic forms of coverage that are continuing to happen, um, possibly well-meaning, but ultimately uh, all that they do is help the, uh, help the conspiracies uh, spread the word and attract more people to their cause. Um, so even today, we're, si we're still seeing journalists make these very fundamental mistakes in, in how they cover these things. Um, and, and I think that's, yeah, that's just really, really problematic. And so it hasn't stopped um, with the end point of, of our data, of course. Um, so let me uh, come to some conclusions here, um, and then hopefully we have a bit of time for discussion still, too. Um, what we observe and what we, uh, I think we can recommend from all of this is first, the really immediate impact of the hardcore conspiracist sites is actually quite limited. Um, they reach a very limited audience. They are perhaps a problem in themselves, but they, they don't in themselves have significant influence beyond that hardcore of people who are already on board with their conspiracy theories. That's really the, the first few phases in our data. We see that, yes, they are raving at the mouth on, uh, about uh, uh, 5G and COVID-19, but it just doesn't really go anywhere. It doesn't reach large audiences beyond the already converted. Celebrities are one of the key um, vectors of spread 
uh, in this. So they can become super spreaders of myths and disinformation. Um, they might think that they're doing the right thing, but by amplifying some of these conspiracy theories, they make them much more visible. They insert them into much more general conversations that are amongst people who are following celebrities, not people who are following conspiracy theories. Um, and, and so they are the ones that make these things yeah, much more visible and much more, more, um, more acceptable possibly as well by endorsing them. Um, uh, and, and that obviously is a, is a very significant problem. Um, and this is aided and abetted by particularly the soft news beats in journalism. So entertainment, sports, uh, tabloid media, um, where possibly uh, the journalistic ethos is far less developed as well. So the, the, the journalists who work for these outlets not all of them, but many of them might be in much more precarious positions. They might be far less well trained. Um, they are, to, to be perhaps a, a little bit disrespecting of them, they are in entertainment journalism because perhaps they, they can't hack it as a political journalist um, or in other hard news areas. So um, they seem to apply, certainly from our data, fewer um, journalistic checks and balances, uh, less fact checking, uh, less uh, review of the impact, I guess, of the stories that they're publishing. Often the coverage of celebrities is very stenographic. It's basically just saying, he said, she said, someone got themselves into hot water, or look, here's, here's a, a screenshot or an embed of their tweet or their Facebook post, uh, isn't it funny? Um, and I think these journalists and these outlets really need to reflect much more on the impact that their reporting has on general public well-being, um, and they need to act more responsibly, particularly when it comes to these kinds of really damaging and, and harmful conspiracy theories. So this is the, the soft underbelly, the weak spot of journalism in many ways. Um, we haven't looked in great detail at takedowns, but what we do see from them is that they do delay and uh, uh, disrupt the dissemination of some of these stories. We see in our data, for instance, that some videos that were shared at some point are taken down and uh, deplatformed and that really um, disrupts the spread. Some of them get, get uploaded again to alternative video sharing sites and reposted and so on. And there's some other workarounds for these takedowns. But um, amongst ordinary users, it seems quite obvious that takedowns do delay this kind of dissemination and do frustrate the, the, the broader spread of, of uh, some of these videos particularly, but also other forms of content. Um, so what that does essentially is to introduce more distance between the mainstream and the fringe groups. Um, it makes it more difficult for fringe conspiracist information to spread into a more mainstream audience and to affect a more mainstream audience. So what's important there, again, from a journalistic point of view is, of course, to, to avoid any kind of news coverage that actually undermines these takedowns by making the content more persistent. So embedding uh, or even uh, posting a screenshot of a celebrity's post, um, embedding a celebrity's uh, conspiracy video, um, in a mainstream news article um, really obviously spreads and, and aids the spread of this damaging information into the mainstream. Sometimes even um, uh, uh, the, some of the, the, the news outlets will actually create their own video version uh, of a conspiracy video and stick that on their own video server. So even YouTube takedowns aren't going to reach that kind of content anymore. So this is, a, again, a very problematic um, kind of activity. So, so news outlets really need to think very carefully about how they're covering this and how much visibility they unwittingly possibly give to uh, this kind of content by reposting it and making it more persistent beyond the takedowns that might happen on the social media platforms themselves. And then, of course, one of the, uh, the really key questions in all of this is when should official authorities, whether that's government or companies or anyone else, uh, experts, um, respond to this mis- and disinformation. Um, if you respond too early, obviously, then like the news coverage, you might just giving this content more visibility. Um, so you don't want to aid in the dissemination of this content, obviously. Um, if you respond too late, well, it's simply too late and, and your response isn't going to make much of a difference anymore. Um, and the other challenge is, of course, to respond in a way that actually reaches the same audiences uh, uh, that have been reached by the conspiracy content itself. So. Um, it's not enough for uh, Michael Gove to, to step up to the podium and say the COVID 5G connection is nonsense, and for that to, report, to be reported in the, in the Times of London. Um, it needs to be reported in those celebrity and tabloid media 
that covered the original conspiracy theory itself. Uh, and that's, of course, very difficult, particularly when the, um, the statements being made by government are so bland and so anemic that they're not going to be of interest to celebrity media. So there need to be other ways of, of doing this. Um, just to give you an example, these are some of the official statements that have been made. This is uh, by the UN saying there is the, this, this whole conspiracy is a, is a hoax with no techn technical basis. That was made on the 22nd of April, 2020. This is the UK government, uh, uh, a guidance on 5G and coronavirus. And doesn't that sound exciting? Um, 6th of May, 2020. Um, this is by the Australian government about misinformation linking 5G and the coronavirus uh, on the 18th of May, 2020. Uh, this is a, a piece in The Guardian, um, uh, uh, and, and of course, this is really here to show the attacks actually happened on the 4th of April. So even the UN response comes a full, what, three weeks or so after the attacks, after the height of the attacks in the UK. So, um, and the, the UK government one comes basically a month after the attacks. So that's not really very helpful anymore at that point, because the, the worst of the crisis has already happened. And government should have responded much more forcefully right at the start, or ideally before the start of these attacks, obviously, to, to ward off these conspiracy theories. A lot of these attacks, are, a lot of these, these statements from government are made very much after the fact and aren't really going to change anything anymore. Um, so um, this, this is, again, a case of, of governments and, and official spokespeople reacting well too late, um, uh, unfortunately. Um, so let me finish here, perhaps, um, with an analogy. And it'd be interesting to, to talk with you a little bit about this, because the more I see the, the, the way that we treat the virus itself and the way that we treat this mis and disinformation, the more I see some similarities. Now, this is perhaps drawing a bit of a long bow, and I don't want to um, just treat everything that spreads virally online with the language of um, epidemiology. But I think there is actually a a useful overlap here. So if you think about the, the takedowns, the deplatforming, and, and some of the digital literacy approaches as well that we're taking to helping people not fall prey to um, uh, conspiracy information, in some ways this equates really to uh, public health measures like lockdowns, like quarantine, like uh, the mask mandates as well. Um, all of this is designed to slow the spread of problematic information to vulnerable communities. Um, it doesn't obviously solve the underlying problem of mis and disinformation of conspiracy theories, but essentially it, it widens the gap between ordinary mainstream communities and the, the fringe communities and cults ultimately who are spreading this mis and disinformation. So these are important measures in, in trying to generate a bigger gap between these communities, make the spread from one to the other uh, more difficult. Um, but uh, the real fix, ultimately, to uh, the spread of this, uh, this pro pro problematic content, or of course to the virus itself, is actually something else. And that's in, in the communication case, it's really de-radicalization. It's really trying to um, starve these communities of, um, of members by de-radicalizing people who are already drawn into them. And in many ways, this is uh, equivalent, perhaps, in the viral sense to vaccination. It's removing potential carriers, potential super spreaders. But it is only efficient if the vast majority of the population are actually protected in that way. Um, if you have a large uh, quantity of the population who are open to radical ideas, who are not vaccinated in the, in the viral case, of course, then this kind of information and the virus itself will continue to spread. Um, and in both cases, actually, you have and you need to have public information campaigns, of course. In either case, they need to enable people to make an informed choice, to, to be comfortable about vaccination, de-radicalization, takedowns, deplatforming, and so on. Um, and that requires clear and accurate information and communication from the public officials, from other stakeholders as well, not necessarily all, always government officials, but experts and, um, uh, and technologists possibly as well. Um, so that only that uh, generates the community trust in these health measures both physical and information so i think again i'm i'm, I'm i have a question mark here and i'm, I'm uh, reluctant to uh, say this is this is entirely equivalent but 
um, I think we need to think about our responses, our, our toolkit of responses to mis and disinformation um, in, in much, as, much the similar way um, that there are sort of immediate responses that we can take to arrest the spread um, at the moment, and then much more longer term and much more difficult responses that we also need to uh, take in order to um, ultimately reduce the risk of further outbreaks by vaccinating, by de-radicalizing. Um, so um, maybe we can have a bit of a chat about that aspect of all of this as well. But with that, I might leave it, and hopefully we have a bit of time for um, discussion as well. Thank you, Axel. So I noticed there's a couple questions that are in the chat window, so you might want to take a quick browse of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had a thought in your questions as you as you were talking that I'll just throw in there. Um, you know, so sometimes viral information is the result of simultaneous cascades. And just slowing down the spread may inhibit the simultaneity, I'm not sure how to say that word, that kicks off percolating clusters that drive viral events. So that's what, so that's just a thought there. But I do notice, like I said, um, um, let's see. So Lenny has a question. Matt's got a question in there. Um, and Jasmina had a question in there. Okay, so where, where, where do we want to start? Um, uh, just looking at the questions here. <laughs> so yes, Bulgaria would be in there if it used the Latin alphabet, um, but if it uses at least the Latin alphabet for terms like 5G and, uh, and COVID, then it might still appear. Um, and uh, yes, uh, same with uh, um, with other alphabets. I see the Iranian Farsi. Yes, absolutely. And we do occasionally pick up a little bit of that when they yeah they take terms or they take um, um, they take posts that um, uh, where, where we capture posts that basically use 5G with the Latin letters when everything else around it is Cyrillic or Farsi. Um, but uh, we wouldn't necessarily have captured the majority of that content if it uses the uh, another alphabet, another script all the way through. Um, so that that is one of the limitations here. And of course, we could, you know, we could have potentially increased our data gathering to a much broader range of of, uh, of capture, but um, uh, we simply didn't have the capacity to to work out what uh, COVID and 5G would look like in, in all sorts of other languages. So we've limited it to the Latin alphabet at this point. Um, the, just going through, uh, Matt Clark, you're talking about the, um, uh, the negative response to government officials. Um, yes, absolutely. And this is, uh, yes, and the Fauci in, in the US obviously has been very much a um, a, a lightning rod, I guess, for uh, for some of these conspiracy groups. This is the same in, in many other countries. Whoever becomes the default expert, essentially, on this um, uh, ends up being attacked. Um, again, to a certain point, if the attacks are coming purely from fringe groups, then um, they may not be worth responding to because it just gives these fringe groups more visibility, of course. So there, there is, again, a, a calculus to be made, um, you know, what to what extent do you engage with these or, or simply ignore and, and thereby essentially deny them platform? Um, uh, but yes, uh, if celebrities got more involved, and there have been, you know, in, in fairness, there have been a bunch of celebrities who've been uh, more active than others in um, talking back and um, essentially responding to perhaps their followers who, who were trying to get them to share mis and disinformation by saying, no, actually, I, I fully agree with the science and I think we should all get vaccinated and masked up and whatever. Um, so uh, some celebrities do get it in the end, but um, uh, quite a few, I think, uh, are, are simply obviously not equipped to, to really fully understand the, the science perhaps, or uh, just not that, that um, interested in it. So we do, I think if we, if we saw more celebrities get involved in the public health effort, then that may well help, of course. Uh, however, um, it could also backfire if a, if a celebrity who's very obviously aligned with one side of politics obviously speaks out, then the other side of politics would probably just say, well, obviously they would say that, wouldn't they? So I don't know, if, if Lady Gaga says, yes, we should all get vaccinated, that's great, and her followers might do it, but the people who hate her aren't, aren't going to be convinced by that. So you'd need really celebrities from all sides of the political spectrum as well in, in doing this. Um, just going through Lenny, um, uh, have you spotted any uh, connections between the current political situation? <laughs> yeah, um, it's it's difficult to say this in um, 
in, in full because again, what, what we're looking at here is covering obviously quite a broad range of countries, but um, I'd say at, at least anecdotally, yes, certainly there, there have been connections between the, the local political context and the um, um, perhaps the visibility of some of these conspiracy theories. Um, there are some really obvious examples, I guess. I mean, in, in Brazil, you've basically got an anti-vaxxer president, for instance. So uh, clearly, um, uh, it, that makes it a lot easier to spread uh, conspiracy theories about this as well. In Italy, I think we saw too that um, uh, with the complex political situation that uh, um, the uh, journalists and experts and, and other groups aligned with various sides of politics uh, have taken very different um, uh, approaches to, to this, and some of them have quite actively been spreading uh, mis- and disinformation content. Um, we do see sometimes some very odd and unusual alliances there as well. So in um, in Germany, for instance, there's the, the far-right um, you know, neo-fascist uh, party, the AFD, that has been very vaccine and, and uh, mask skeptic particularly, and has been spreading some conspiracy theories at times. Um, and oddly enough, they, they kind of often align with the alternative health uh, or alternative medicine uh, fringes um, that are uh, essentially also rejecting scientific evidence and are pushing their own uh, you know, wonder remedies, whether that's hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin or, or whatever else is, is the, the current drug that they're, they're pushing. Um, so uh, uh, sometimes you get these kind of weird lines between what, what is far right and what normally would have been perhaps far, far left and, and uh, quite hippie ultimately. Um, so there, there are some really weird connections there that we see there as well. Um, but uh, I, I wouldn't want to go as far as, as making any kind of general claims here because we, we would need to look more, much more specifically into the situation in specific countries to do this. Um, I, I will say just very briefly on this, we have another research project at the moment that's looking at the dissemination of content from the Russian propaganda outlet RT um, uh, on Facebook across different language communities. And we're, we're lucky enough to have a, a bunch of people in our center who speak um, Arabic, German, French, Russian, Spanish, and so we're, we're able to do more of a cross-country and cross-language study there. Um, so uh, with, with that, we are, again, looking at, well, where in, in these uh, countries or where in these language communities is, is RT content actually being shared? And we're seeing there's some very different alignments with the far right in Germany, with the, to some extent, the far left in France, um, with uh, the far right and or the far left in, in Latin American countries, depending on who's currently in opposition. So there, there are, you know, it's, it's the disenfranchised that, that in, in whatever political system you're in that often seem to be particularly open to spreading conspiracy theories. But uh, again, more on that once we've, we've developed this a bit further. Um, uh, and yes, Jeff, you, you mentioned the, the, uh, the spread of information cascades. And of course, some of the measures now that Facebook and Twitter have been taking by having these overlays saying, well, this is potentially misinformation or Twitter saying, well, would you like to read the story first before you retweet it? I think those nudges can help to a certain extent, although at some point people will probably just bank these nudges and kind of just ignore them because they, they're just so common now. Um, and of course, for, for real conspiracy theorists, um, those nudges might actually be an encouragement because it means that, hey, we must be onto something. Facebook is trying to hide what we're doing. Um, that's not a reason not to do it because for ordinary people, it might still help. Uh, and the conspiracists you have to address, I think, in different ways with really de-radicalization. But um, it, yeah, there is a there's a limit to how far this can go, I think. Um, and uh, I think, Jenny, you've got your hand up as well. Hey, Axel, it's great to listen to you. Um, <laughs> uh, hopefully my internet, it's really bad right now. So hopefully I come across as not a pixelated set of mush. Um, so I really appreciate this presentation. And one of the things that struck me um, as you were presenting on these five phases, I happen to know that you do other research that also is looking at conspiracy spread on other topics. And I'm kind of curious whether those five phases as you describe them are, um, is that, is there potentially a, I don't know what the word is exactly, but does, do you see that in other conspiracist and misinformation spread, or are the dynamics different? And in other words, every 
I don't know, misinformation plot, if you will, manifest differently as it spreads through digital media? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I'm, I'm not sure I can say yet, to be honest. Um, and uh, I guess maybe just for background, so Jenny is also uh, part of a research project we have here that's basically about the spread of mis and disinformation. Um, and uh, for that, we've, we've gathered um, a, a very large data set essentially of, of links to uh, known or suspected um, problematic news sites, fake news sites, if you will, um, uh, uh, from Facebook over the last few years. Um, what we what we haven't done yet, really, and that's that's I think that would help answer that question, is to look at a broader range of conspiracy uh, stories or, or you know fake news stories essentially, and how they spread um, uh, over time. And I think that will help give us an idea of whether these phases are kind of repeated in other cases as well or not. Um, I think it it may depend to some extent on the nature of the, the conspiracy uh, story as well. Some, of course, are very narrow and very short lived. So, you know, I don't know, did Joe Biden wear an earpiece at one of the, the presidential debates or not? You know, that's that's a very limited kind of thing that, that um, <laughs> exactly that is there and then disappears again and, and isn't probably going to spread in this way. Um, but some of the bigger themes, I guess, not so much conspiracy stories themselves, but themes. And, and, and in some ways, I should perhaps talk about the 5G stuff as a, as a, as a theme as well, because it has a number of different angles, a number of different ways it's expressed. As you've seen, you know, some of it is is linking it to, um, you know, fringe religious kind of views. Some of it is linking it to, you know, global new world order kind of claims and whatever. Um, uh, but with these sorts of larger kind of more complex themes, I think it is quite possible that there is a, a gradual kind of spread from the fringes to the mainstream and, and um, that again, there, there will be these sorts of tipping points, I guess, at which it moves from the fringe into a much more uh, visible kind of space. Um, and I would, I would expect to some extent celebrities and, 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 and kind of gateway media, I guess, to be playing a role there. Yeah, it's interesting actually, the celebrity piece is, inter I, I hadn't really thought about the role of celebrities um, in as amplifiers of mm. these messages. And so that you caught that I think is really important. Um, and I think it goes back to something that Matt had raised in his comment about, you know, if you can, from an intervention point of view, um, working to encourage influencers to provide counter messaging mm. with their large audiences and that, that massive voice to be able to uh, drown out or counter or push against some of the conspiracist and misinformation ideation that's coming from other mm. corners. You can't stamp it out. I mean, that's, <laughs> we've always believed yeah. in conspiracies and we spread a misinformation, um, but maybe there are some, from an intervention point of view, things that could be done um, in service of supporting public health, for example, with COVID. Mm. So anyway, Absolutely. awesome stuff, Axel, really appreciate it. Thanks. Um, one, just maybe as an anecdote here, um, one campaign that we've seen in Australia, for instance, is um, the our largest uh, uh, telephony provider, Telstra, has um, run a campaign, is still running a campaign uh, with a popular comedian, Mark Humphrey, um, who is essentially, um, yeah, doing this in a, as a kind of, kind of comedic stick, uh, stick that he's basically um, uh, you know, sitting in an office saying, yeah, we're rolling out 5G soon, you, you won't need your phone anymore, it'll all be in, intravenous or whatever. Um, so um, just really making fun of these claims and thereby, yeah, making, I guess, the, the responses much more visible as well. Um, and that reaches obviously a very different audience from just some crusty Telstra spokesman kind of going on camera saying, you know, there's nothing wrong with 5G. Um, so that that I think these sorts of approaches do help, and the more yeah celebrities and others can be enlisted. Of course, when I say celebrities too, it's not literally just you know singers and actors, but it, there are political celebrities as well, and others, sports stars, and anyone else who's got a, a significant amount of visibility and a particular audience who could be involved in this. And you're right, just influencers online and others uh, really have a role to play in all of this too. Um, I'm just, Jeff, I know you've got your hand up. I'm just going to go quickly to, to Matt uh, Clark here again, too. Um, so that uptick about uh, entering isolation. Again, we, we haven't done any detailed data work on this, but we have uh, certainly seen that um, 
the uh, outbreak, for instance, of uh, Romanian um, uh, spread of, of this story um, uh, seemed to happen exactly at the point that the Romanian government declared a, a nationwide lockdown. Um, we saw actually in the US as well when um, there was there's sometimes just a, a, a kind of a very um, opportunistic response to lockdowns. We saw a number of stories circulating that uh, lockdowns in the US were being used to secretly install 5G in schools. So sometimes it's it's the story itself that's being used. Sometimes I think it is genuinely that as people are going into lockdown, they're sitting at home 24 seven, they can't go anywhere, can't do anything. And what do you do? You go online and you try and find out when this is going to be over and what, what really is happening. And you pay more attention perhaps because suddenly it, it affects you. Um, so I do think there is a there is a connection there between people just sitting around being frustrated and people drifting off into more um, you know more fringe areas or, or simply searching more widely than they do. Um, yeah, doom scrolling exactly. And there is a uh, I think there is some uh, much older research as well that uh, that says that particularly at times of crisis, of course, uh, when the general uh, information environment isn't very clear yet, and even official sources don't have all the answers, um, that people are more willing to search more widely and basically accept the plausible ex explanations that that they come across, even from uh, less reliable sources, because they're simply desperate for any kind of answers, any kind of you know future pathways or whatever out of this. So if the government is quite rightly saying we don't know yet, then they're going to go to some medical expert that says, well, if we just switch off five G, everything will go back to normal. Um, that's that's of course simplifying it, but uh, I think there is a there is a pattern there, and that's that's uh, there's been some evidence uh, over the years that yeah people will end up um, just going to to some fringe outlets if the main ones don't don't really provide them the the, the answers that they're looking for. Um, Jeff. Yeah. So I so one of the comments Jenny made reminded me of something that I was thinking about during your talk. You show a slide where you've got an area graph, <clears throat> the area mm. graph is showing the phases. But another thing that that area graph was doing is it's showing the increase in stories over time, which creates a shape and the shape is kind mm. of a standard shape, right? So we've seen that a lot. And in fact, if you fit a curve to that line, then you can measure the growth over time. Mm. And then you could, if you could create that curve for multiple different conspiracy theories, then you might be able to do things like predict if the curve is sharp enough, does that mean that something is going to happen offline mm. you know, in the real world? Or at a certain point, then that's when things take off, right? So there's, there's actually been a fair amount of research on predicting how far virality is going to spread based on the shape of the signature so mm -hmm. that might be an interesting direction to go if if you have more cases yeah absolutely and the other part i guess that we're we're kind of interested in using this for too is um to really get a sense of well when when should there be official responses again that, that question as i said is not too early not too late you need to find that sort of goldilocks zone where where now you can have an impact you can ward off the, the further spread of this without simply going too early and giving it more attention than it had in the first place. Um, and I've, I've got a, a, a new PhD student who's actually been doing some work here with uh, one of our state governments as a social media analyst. And um, uh, they, they really, in, in, that, in that very practical work in state government, which has responsibility for, for handling the, the crisis, um, they have faced that problem over and over again, where, you know, yes, there are you know, claims about lockdowns or claims about quarantine or claims about whatever, masks and so on. Um, and they've had to work out over and over again, well, if this is circulating, at what point is it circulating enough that it warrants a response from government or whoever is the appropriate spokesperson um, yeah. to, to stop that from circulating further or to, to at least arrest the spread a bit. Um, and yeah, with with that sort of curve or with, with some sort of measure, I guess, of both the the volume, but also the the reach, I guess. So if it's if it's high volume, but in in spaces of you know tens of people, maybe not not need to respond. But once it starts to hit those million plus uh, uh, groups, 
then there probably is a need to, to really engage with that and, and, and ward it off. So yeah, trying to work out where is that kind of, that tipping point essentially where it reaches a wider audience and can you capture it and, and just stop it before it reaches that tipping point, I think would be very, very important. I, I don't know how, again, I don't know how systematic that is and how much this, this would be the same for different conspiracy stories. We simply need to do more work on this and, and try and understand this better. And um, of course, we need to look at it across platforms as well. And this is all, all from Facebook, but uh, some of this stuff, uh, all of this stuff spreads on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on WhatsApp, on, on the minor platforms as well. So we've got to get a bigger sense of all of this um, rather than just rely on Facebook as sort of the, the big platform, I guess. Thank you, Axel. So we've kept Axel kind of a long time. Are there any last minute short questions and if not, maybe we'll close up. Axel, thanks a lot for taking the time to talk with us. Pleasure. Thank you all. It's been a great conversation as well. Thank you. Take care. All right. Thanks very much. See you soon, yep. hopefully. <laughs> right.